This is Critical Nonsense, our high lowbrow show about culture, science, and tech. This week, Joey asks us about navigating our boundaries, and Aaron asks us about the side effects of creator culture. Look at the stars. <laughs> and it was all Joey. This is what Joey sounds like. I like uh, that's what a Joey sounds like. Just as you, I'm sorry, weird turn, but I just had to say, just as you saying that, I got a snap from a friend with the caption, turns out toilet paper holders are weirdly expensive. <laughs> and that, there's a juxtaposition there that must mean something. Joey sounds like both of those things. Like, that's ye- fair. like yellow and like a toilet paper holder. I'm not going to unpack that anymore. Instead, what do you get when you hear an Aaron? This is what an Aaron sounds like. Hello. And this is what an executive producer and Chris Martin stan, Jess Vander, sounds like. Hi, this is Jess, the one who just told you about the weirdly expensive toilet paper holder thing. <laughs> and that's really efficient and effective. Um, what sort of, uh, speaking of toilet paper holders, housekeeping do we have to cover? Um, We're all stocked up on dry goods, so I think we can get into it, I suppose. Let's just get to the topics. I I don't have time for house cleaning. House cleaning? House cleaning. That's fair. I don't even have time to use all of the letters, so let's move on. (laughs) I love it. So, um, y'all, there's a number of things in my life that have been bringing me to my topic. Um, Mm. Let's start with the funny side of things. <laughs> I saw a tweet this week where someone put up, it says, you know, my new office neighbor has a very sensible office door policy. Uh, and it says door open, very welcome to knock and come in. Yes, I would love to have a chat. Door closed, please do not knock at my door or come in unless you have urgent business, asterisk. I am extremely easily distracted and I will talk to you until the end of time instead of writing my dissertation. Never come in without knocking. (laughs) The asterisk note is list of things that are urgent business. The building or someone is on fire. You're bringing me coffee. Revolution. There is a dog. Wait, this is not your door. Who who is this? (laughs) Who is this? What is this? Um, And at the same time, so... Uh, Aaron and I are entering into a new <laughs> stage of our career in which we need to be handled. Um, where, oh, I said I read a tweet. Jess is like, whose office door policy is? No, but whose office door policy? Was? It's just like some <laughs> random internet? Yeah, it's a it's an internet person's office neighbor. I see. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um Aaron and I are entering into a stage of our careers where we need um, like shared executive assistants, uh, people helping to manage us, which has um, been an interesting experience. And both of these are coming together around this idea of boundaries and the idea of setting boundaries. And um, this experience with having some EA support has been an adventure for me in like, Oh, you need boundaries. Like it's like someone literally just being like, you need some boundaries and I'm going to help establish boundaries in your life. And like, you know, outside of the sort of experience of feeling like a child again, (laughs) where someone's like, you're doing it wrong. I'm going to like push you through your life and tell you all the things to do and whatever, which has been wonderful and, and humbling and bizarre and strange. It, it is this like, I let things get too far without establishing boundaries or thinking that I didn't need boundaries or any of those things. And so in, in sort of a uncharacteristic of our show, open-ended question, Jess, if you'll allow me, my question is, can we talk about boundaries? (laughs) Yes. Now what's the open-ended question? (laughs) You, you can talk about them next. Um, uh, what do we do with boundaries? Do we need boundaries? Do we? How do we use them? I don't know. (laughs) 
so I think I cannot help but respond to or like talk about this with a couple of things. One is that I am equally with Joey as uncomfortable in this. It's weird. It's weird. Uh, I think just because a, like an assistant, uh, an administrative executive assistant sounds. It just has a lot of things and trappings attached to it that make. I think me and or us sound like assholes or better than anyone else. And we're not. <laughs> it is very obvious if you've listened to this show before. That we are not. And I think that that's impo- like, I feel the need to like be very clear that this is not like an ego trip or boost, but I can say it has been a humbling experience wildly. And I think that like the thing that has, that it has illuminated for me has been the like the the realistic limits of an entrepreneurial mindset like i think that anyone who is ambitious anyone who wants to do as much as possible likely comes from a mindset of i can say yes and figure it out later like say yes and then figure it out and it'll get figured out and it'll be strong and it'll be great and it'll be fine you may not sleep you may like give up seeing anybody for a couple months, but like you'll do it and it'll be good and it'll be worth it and it'll be fine and you'll move on and hopefully at some point it'll like ebb and flow. Um, and it it does ebb and flow, but it's almost like without clear boundaries and without having somebody to like look at your calendar and look at what you alone are doing and say, yo, <laughs> you can't do that. Like you just can't. And you're letting yourself down. Like the only person that is going to be let down at the end of this all is going to be you because you're going to give everything away to everyone else who needs you to be there. That's, that's why you're here is to support others. To be clear. I feel like both of you are saying, Anyway, it sounds like anyway that neither you nor any person who has an assistant is particularly deserving of one. And it's weird to think then about like, then why do we get them? And it's right. And in this case, it feels like it's it's because the type of the type of role you're playing at our company is the kind that would bet like you'll be able to do your job better if someone else is attached to you the other side of your donkey costume you know what i mean yes i need a head because i'm definitely the ass <laughs> to be very clear on that one uh that was good jess you set me up on that that was very uh, <laughs> but that is like I, I find that um the amount of administrative mind space that gets taken up on a daily basis is without a doubt stealing from other aspects of life and that's that is to your point Something that a lot of people deal with in professional life. Um, I think that what's curious about our work collectively is the um, the depth <laughs> of thinking and planning that is required to be a useful partner. Um, as well as the, I was just talking about this the other day, yo-yo thinking. Being able to go very conceptual and higher order and being able to zoom out and then in the blink of an eye, immediately go to the practical and can this be done in one day? Can this be done in two days? Is this some, Is there a smarter way to do this because this actually isn't possible? And when you're just yo-yoing that way across five different you know, commitments with clients on top of five or so different commitments to your other teammates on other projects, and then you layer in the rest of your life that you sort of just keep forgetting about. <laughs> You're like, all right, I'm supposed to have friends and family and talk to them. Uh, you, it, it's really easy to think that that is okay. And to think that that's just the way you need to be. Yeah, I guess, how does that thought tie to the open door question, Joey, mm. to you? Yeah, I think, you know, this experience that Aaron and I had spoken about today, I think that's why this came up. We're both like, this it feels weird. And and I don't, like, I, I like, I like having the support and also I feel weird and uncomfortable with it and all that. 
And this question of the, the sort of open door policy and setting boundaries to me is interesting because it is like the the EA part of it is just relevant to Aaron and my life. But the boundaries question I think is relevant to everyone. I've been having conversations and I think, you know, not, not uniquely, I think like a lot of people are having these conversations right now. But I was having a conversation with someone earlier this week about, um, you know, having come back from burning out um, and this idea of, and, and talking with them, like, like, let's talk about how you can set boundaries and, and establish like, what do you need? And I think that's the part of these boundaries that is sort of interesting to me in both sides of the conversation is an establishment of like, I think why I've often felt uncomfortable with boundaries is this sort of like Isaiah Berlin, positive freedom, negative freedom, that in asking someone something, when I'm establishing a boundary, I'm thinking about what am I taking away from them by establishing a boundary with them, as opposed to what am I enabling for myself? And I, I, I think I have a tendency, not as like a pat on the back, type of thing, but I think I have a tendency to start with the other person's perspective first and then um, come back to myself and sort of put the other person, it, whether it's a client, a friend, whatever, put their situation or their feelings first. And the result of that is that by not, you know, establishing those boundaries with someone and, and being willing to ask, right, a, a boundary is a request. It, it's not a thing you can mandate it is, you know, a fence can be climbed over. Uh, it, it is a suggestion, right? Like don't come in, <laughs> don't climb over my fence, I guess. Um, and so that, that idea of like being willing to ask as, or establish a boundary as part of like an ongoing relationship and, and dialogue with another person or entity or whatever, so that you can perform and function and, and that, that it is part of this sort of like, when I say transactional dynamic between people, I don't mean it in sort of like the pejorative way that we talk about transactions, but that the like relationships are give and take and that you're sort of, it's a request for a need that you have, right? Like in that door example, it was like, I will talk to you till the end of time, right? Like it says that thing, like, if you talk to me, I will talk to you until forever, but I have this thing I need to do. And if, if you are not willing to give me this privacy, then I won't be able to accomplish the thing I need to accomplish for myself. And like having that open conversation about your needs is really interesting where it changes this idea of like boundaries being like a demand that you're placing on others to like a request for a thing that you need as a person. I don't know if that's even like interesting or unique or new. It, it's just, it's sort of like this shift in my mind that I'm going through. It does like break me apart in a few different directions or like it, it takes me in one way to the difference between requesting someone to respect your boundaries and then like managing your own impulses. And I find that that those are like two different realities that revolve around the boundaries. And I struggle much more with the latter. I'm all, like, I have to, <laughs> I was just saying to Joey a couple days ago, like I just figured out that I need to turn my chats off on my phone because I, like I can't not look at my phone. I also can't not respond, especially because I can't not feel like I've read something. I didn't respond because I was going to respond later. And then I like, you know, it fell through the the to do list and then I never got to it because visually it doesn't have a notification anymore. Like it's a little bit of my worst nightmare. And so it was just like, <laughs> turn the chats off when you're not in front of your computer. Don't do it. And it's a boundary I set up for myself. That's possible. <laughs> like, yes. I was Good like, mind. yeah, I don't have my notifications on. <laughs> yeah. And part of that, Aaron, I feel like is just a factor of not just what Joey, you had said about communicating your needs, but figuring out what you need at all. Yes. 
Like I yes. he, like I it seems need to turn my chats off is a mm-hmm. realization that may not be obvious to all people. Yes, yes. And also expecting it's so interesting because it also gets back to like um what the emotional need is beneath that and whether or not you need to request that of someone else and whether or not anybody you think has a right to like abide by it. Because for me, it's that I want to give you my full attention. And I know that if I can't give you my full attention, then I'm doing you wrong. And therefore, like, I'm, there are times when you can chat me and I won't respond because my phone is across the room. And as a person also, my phone is always somewhere else. I don't think people know this about me. My phone really? is, like, almost always in a different room. I don't have it. Like, if I'm huh. out, like, and about, sure, it's in my pocket. But if I'm at home, guarantee you it's, like, in the bathroom on the sink and oh, I'm in the living room every time. I can't, anyway. <laughs> I, I will, I will miss important notifications. If, if I don't check my email on my computer, unless I have been notified on my phone that I should look at my email, which is a, maybe bad. <laughs> it's, a, no. it's almost a tendency to check out so deeply because I'm so focused on the thing, but that's why I have to have my, I personally, I, I need to have that as a way to mm-hmm. stay connected. But I can imagine too, right. If you have, if that is a specific boundary that one must set for themselves, like you can create a really healthy habit. Yeah. It, it, works feel, for you. it feels like the, the, you know, in this continued sort of search for the silver linings of the pandemic and, and the sort of like undulation between wallowing in what we've lost in the pandemic and sort of looking for those moments where there is something positive that the, the the pandemic itself has been a continuous conversation about boundaries, right? Like you cannot pass this boundary without a mask. You can't do this thing. You are going to be working from home. How do you evaluate what your workday looks like? And how do you begin to sort of establish like a new evaluation of your needs in this new situation that none of us have been in before, right? And so in this process, like, the this conversation of like I, I'm not going to get things from the place that I've been getting them potentially like so where am I going to get it becomes a, a a constant reappraisal of new behaviors and so for me when we were coming into the pandemic right it was like you know trying to make sure that like we keep the lights on and the doors open you know metaphorically i guess we were all at home but uh keep the door closed physically (laughs) um and and like working and figuring out new things like the boundaries had blurred so much for me that it was like working all the time and all of that and so all of a sudden i'm it like over the course of the past 18 or 20 months it's like i'm not going to work on the weekend anymore as like a boundary And if I need to do something, right, then I'll do it. But that needs to be the exception, not the rule. And it was never that I was like crazily doing those things, but it it was, I wasn't having any conscious discussion about that, right? Like there was no intention around the way that I was doing things and beginning to start to have these conversations about, about like, it's interesting, right? Like having a young child too, all of a sudden, you know, this thing that I felt like was negative, you see, like, you know, everyone is like, you have to set boundaries, you have to establish boundaries, like all of that. I'm like, oh, well, this does kind of work for her. And like, you get more comfortable being like, no, and I'm not going to change my mind. (laughs) And so all of a sudden, I can be like, oh, maybe I can do that in like other parts of my life, too. Like, huh. It's the Oprah. Oh, sorry, Jess, go ahead. I need to know it's the Oprah what? Oh, it's just my favorite Oprah quote, which is that no is a complete sentence. Um, And like that, Mm -hmm. it it took her forever to learn that. And like that, I still work on that every day. It's always like, no, because this or no, but this or no. And here's the counter. And in fact, you can have no in your life. And that's good. Wow. Yeah, I was so so I understand. (laughs) Yeah, I was just going to say it felt like the thing that you brought up earlier, Aaron, about requesting uh adherence to the boundaries yes it's sort of like it, it you know joey's comment about 
everything that the pandemic has made us face when it comes to boundaries illuminates that where I think that we all had to spend a lot, have had to spend a lot more time thinking about what we value and what's important to us. The next thing is then thinking about how and and practicing how best to articulate that to others. And then the third is then managing our relationship with those things. Like what do we do now that we have those things that we know and that we've expected of others? And I think that the like the realization part, honestly, was the easy part. Cause like, that's just the nature of sitting alone and staring at a wall for a while. Like <laughs> you, like you're going to get to deep shit soon, but then practicing, <laughs> practicing, articulating what you need from people who don't owe you anything, I think has been one of the most powerful things because I found a whole different vocabulary. Um, I think there were times in the past where, for example, I would say like, I need this <laughs> and that's all well and good, but like, I need a billion bucks. So <laughs> don't like, gotta make that happen. And then I really, and Joey, your example of the tweet itself, like there's so much baked into that. There's um, the expression of like fundamental appreciation for other people. Like, mm-hmm. I, I want to talk to you. Like, you, this is my intention. The reality is that I know what I need to do and I know my limits. And I know that like, sometimes my impulses are gonna take me to your dog. Um, as opposed, which I'm going to allow to happen, but I can't just do it to talk about Minecraft. Like, yeah, and and you and that you can establish it with humor and kindness too, right? Yes, yes, that's exactly it. Like, you can learn that there are different, um, l- l- uh, different motifs or different language styles that you can use to express different types of boundaries to different people. And I'm kind of curious, just with y'all, <laughs> question and a question. I don't know if we've done this before. Are there any like? Ways that you have learned or seen being very unproductive in requesting other people to respect your boundaries. I definitely have some. Or successful. We'll leave that door open, too, even though the other one's more fun. (laughs) In my personal life, one that I don't know if it was particularly effective, but it sounded pretty similar to this internet person where I was like, I have no personal boundary on quality time and will leech as much as I am given. <laughs> so, if, <laughs> so if you have one, you have to let me know because otherwise I will take it from you. I, lo- <laughs> I love that. That's a very good one. That's very specific. It's like too. I just really loved hanging out. It's like, all right, I gotta go. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Because <laughs> I was about to say we should hang out more. Actually, I had a similar one, which is still alive, and it was just tested this past weekend, which is that when people come to stay with me, Mm. I now realize that I need an hour nap at least every day. Like, Mm. while you're here, I do. Mm. Like, I need to sit in a bed, be alone during the daytime. I just need a break. And I realized that I could tell, like, guests that, and they wouldn't bite my head off. (laughs) <laughs> they didn't think that I was rude or like mm. I was wasting their time for having come out here. I came to see you and you're not mm-hmm. even wanting to see me. That did not happen. It wasn't a real world Philadelphia fight in like my apartment. It was no, like it was nap time. <laughs> it was nap time. And guess what? Every adult wants nap time. That's the other part that I didn't know that became very clear as a result of that. Yeah, I, th- I think for me, it has just been like. If you're just open about Mm. it right like like you said it's like i'm an introvert i really want you here and Mm -hmm. i know i also need a break and so i'm just gonna take a nap for an hour like that that sort of transparency and sort of like vulnerability about your needs i think just like does so much to to help people want to give you the thing that you need i think like most people are generally good like obviously their shitheads exist but like if you say like i need this thing so i can function most people are like okay yeah that sounds cool like great so this is a little this is a little bit of like maybe strategy inside baseball but not really so got this research moderation tip years ago that was really important to me because of this boundary thing which is when I'm setting up a session or a group, it's particularly with like groups, I always say at the beginning of it, I might interrupt you. And it's specifically just because I want to like 
respect everyone's time and move on. It's not because I don't care about what you're saying or I don't think it's important. And having someone tell me, like, first of all, you can say that and it frees you to do what you need to do as a moderator who is Mm -hmm. working within a finite amount of time to get certain insight out of a small group of people. But also, you need to make your own rules for whenever you're doing these sessions. What are the other things that make you uncomfortable that you can simply tell people, I'm going to be doing this. For, I might do this for this reason. And then it's like, oh, I don't have to sit in my head and spin and not listen to you instead. Yeah. Yeah. And like what Joey had said earlier about this false dichotomy of like, either I'm asking something that's going to inconvenience you or like make you have to do a thing or I'm going to get a thing. It seems in a situation like that, that you're describing Aaron, that that can also just be a win-win for somebody of like, oh, cool, I'm helping. Like when, th- when they interrupted me, I helped. So that's great. It's like, that's great. Yes. So I think this brings us to Jess's boundary corner. The corner yes. has four walls. And that's a ceiling a and a floor. That's just it's, a cube. Uh, that's, that's fair. <laughs> Jess's wrap-up cube. I, I'm really... I don't know if at the beginning I could see the connection between a random internet person tweet about office doors that did sound very clever and funny. Uh, Your incoming personal productive assistance at work and this idea of setting boundaries that has been defining for the better part of the last year and a half. But it actually feels like a really natural fit for these things to get put together. And I don't know if, if I'm taking away anything, it's the two things that we talked about, which is taking stock of what boundaries we may need to be setting that we haven't yet and practicing what it looks like to actually ask for those things when we need them and not having it always feel demanding. Maybe it can just be a win-win request that makes everybody happier and Joey drinking more water in a day. You know, that, that could be good. Like, I, I want you to, to not be thirsty while working because you don't get water for yourself. You, you also don't get enough lunch. You don't get enough lunch. Or you meal. Lunch more often. You're not yeah. fueling yourself and it makes me mm-hmm. worried. Just my, my wrap up of your wrap up corner is you got inside of my brain for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. But how does this work? These three very <laughs> different things. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of work related to culture lately, and in particular related to um, influencers, content, and media, and like really starting to focus on like the more like paid and in-your-face creator culture. Um, And also like the permeability across like long form platforms and shorter platforms. Uh, So like you've got your TikToks and and your Instagrams and whatnot. And then you've got your YouTubes and your Netflixes and your all that kind of stuff. Um, But in any case, one of the things that's come up that didn't come out of my mind, it actually came out of Joey's mind. (laughs) Oh, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about it is about a lot of the the impacts of how much that economy has grown, how much these creators and the expectations of these creators are changing our perception of what it means to um, to be creative, like what it means to be able to generate new knowledge or content and put it forth in the world and what the expectations are around any individual person in, in creating something novel and breakthrough. So I think we'll go into a number of different directions with this, but the question on my mind is, what is the solo creator economy doing to us? Uh, TLDR breaking us. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, I've mentioned before we came on, I've been thinking about um, Gary Steingart's super sad, true love story. Uh which is like a a book from 2009, maybe 2010. Um, And there's this like moment where extreme near future fiction was like, had a, had a moment Um, like rainbow's end was coming out at that time. And and some other like 
books that were having a lot of influence and it just felt so prescient and just continues to feel prescient. And a lot of it was around this sort of um, idea in the book that like everyone has a, like a status rating that because of like AR, you can see everyone's status rating based on like the amount of content that they're creating and the, uh, and it covers like a lot of topics, but that is sort of like one part of it. And it feels like this idea of the creator economy and sort of the impetus to continuously be putting things out as sort of an evaluation of um, your merit or your relevance or your status in society. Well, I, I think like the the weight of that thing probably depends on which pockets of society or which cultures you're participating in. But I was like telling you, like I was at twice this weekend in like the most absurd spaces. I went to Coney Island. I was at like the little kids part of the amusement park with Emerson, just doing like a couple little kids rides. Side note, got motion sick on a little kid ride. Cool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the But seeing a woman doing like a full out like photo shoot for her like Insta with like legit high end cameras and like all these things and just doing like the, if I say like, you know, the poses she was doing, like you get it, <laughs> right? Like, um, and I was just like, this is like a lot of effort and energy into like putting out some like pictures of yourself at like the little kid part of like Coney Island, like what's going on. Um, and so it just feels like th this like pressure to produce is like workism in like, in just like everyday life or like, it just feels like another form of workism or something. I was just listening to the, uh, reply all episode about Paris Hilton and how in the heyday of Paris's younger self where it you know the infamous line of like she's just famous for being famous is like now just like a normal thing that is highly valuable right like back then it was denigrated for not being valuable and now it is a thing of actual measurable value and commercial viability um and I'm like, uh, I guess I'm wondering, I don't know if this is related to the what you're saying about workism, but when you said at the beginning of Aaron introducing this to us that like it's breaking us, I guess I'm wondering, do you still think that this is not a valuable thing that people are spending their time doing? Like, what is the, I don't know. Is that the feeling that you had, like looking at this person, like, what is that? I mean, so... I can identify very closely with the idea of being somewhere and seeing an influencer doing the influencing live in yeah. public. Um, this has been the feature of moving to West Hollywood is that I literally look out my window and on in the little courtyard at least three times a week. There are like, you know, three people huddled together, different people every time doing a photo shoot. And it's like mm. very different situations every time. Sometimes it's like, a very risque uh, bathing suit photo shoot. Sometimes it's like clearly like friends partying in the pool. What's up? Like it's like <laughs> turn up moment for like yeah. vibes sake. Yeah. Um, but the pressure that I can see from all of these, it's what we talk about. I think for a long time is like not actually living the moments, but being so focused on documenting them, seeing that professionally, seeing people doing that, like in what in is ostensibly their free time um it, it it smacks me in the face with like i can understand it i can understand the allure of it a hundred percent you've got like trappings of entrepreneurialism you are going to do this on your own you don't have a boss to serve like you are doing you and that means that your rules are the only rules you also have this crazy sense of meritocracy that mm -hmm. like it's just based on how hard i work and how much people see me if i don't put out right. content then i'm not going to get responded to um, the, one of the weird parts about it is the, like the, um, I guess the mystique or the mirage of individualism 
that the only person on the uh, like the 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 influencer on the other side of the camera is the person doing all of the work and the reality is that just like with any other piece of content that is being produced there's a team behind it and sometimes that team is so big like you know i live across the street from a movie studio as well so like i'm constantly seeing shoots going on and they're pretty big like um music video productions things like that and and you know i've worked in advertising so i'm like familiar with the fact that like yes for every person on one side of the camera there's 50 to 100 on the other side of the camera mm-hmm. that is extremely standard um but still this like the way that it plays out in these smaller pockets and the way that folks might think that um it is easy is the weird part the amount of work that goes into it and the amount of sacrifice that goes into it, it isn't sexy at all. And I, I think that that I find that to be one of the things that's breaking us is that it's it makes it seem all upside and no downside when in fact we're just not hearing all the stories of where things aren't working out, where they are going awry. And it's as tragic as we've heard in like 1940s Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, there's an aspect to it too, in, in what you're talking about, like one, it's not one person and two, the, um, the, the sort of weird fracturing that happens, right? Like, the number of platforms like that beget mm-hmm. new platforms that beget new platforms it is sort of overwhelming, right? Like, you know, OnlyFans did a thing and that became its own platform. And then uh, Fan House was like less lewd, but basically the same thing as OnlyFans. And then, you know, Clubhouse did a thing and then Locker Room is a thing, right? Like, and and how are those different than YouTube or Spotify or uh, you know TikTok or Instagram or whatever? And like the this sort of like massive proliferation of those things because every right like you need to be able to host the volume of content that sort of so many people feel like an impetus to create is weird. But then the the other side of it is this idea that sort of emerges, and we actually like wrote about this in the dots when we wrote the book was like the expectation was that like you can have a sort of incredible amount of reach but your actual ability to be influential even if we call you an influencer you know theoretically should be limited right like if i become famous for being a makeup artist or an artist or a photographer or a science blogger or whatever like that that initial basis of your um influence or notoriety or fame or whatever becomes the reason why anyone would listen to you and that that your sort of um influence in other domains would be less relevant but now at this point you're seeing weird things right like the paul brothers doing like fights right like they're doing boxing matches but they became famous logan paul and jake paul uh are like YouTube stars that became famous for making, I think, like pranky type of videos. I think on, a, I don't know that I've ever actually watched one of their videos, but that's sort of like the general premise that I get. They've gotten in trouble, one of them, for going to that Japanese um, suicide forest and actually like putting, uh, showing someone who had committed suicide in the uh, trigger warning, I, I guess. Uh, in the forest on like one of their YouTube videos. So they're like that type of person. Um, But now they're doing like MMA fights or boxing matches and people are paying to see them fight unexpected people, which is, you know, it's like a carnival show, but like people who are like very into boxing or MMA are like, why why are people paying money for this thing? They're like very bad at that. Um, and, And so like this, And I think that's also why you're seeing like an increase in scandals where it's like this person got famous for, you know, maybe they're funny or maybe they're pretty or handsome or whatever. And then they're like having opinions about subjects in other areas. And also someone's like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like you shouldn't weigh in on economic policy or you shouldn't be weighing in on like corporate policy around, you know, like natalism or, or, parental rights like why are you weighing in on this 
Logan Paul or whoever. And, and so the scandals perpetuate. And it's this idea of like, it feels like it, it is an extension of like the death of expertise in some way. And it's also a manifestation of how the internet exists or social media exists as like one part, the- well, equal parts, theater and coliseum. Like at one moment, we want to just be entertained and we want to see skill. We want to see people do the things that are so amazing. And it can be like intellectual skill. It could be creative skill. It could be a lot of different things. But at any moment, the comment section, you're going to have the Roman thumb. And the next thing you know, it's like release the lions. I am here to watch the dudes that got canceled and somehow are making all their money back. I want to see them get beat up in a boxing ring like it does like very naturally feed such a sick imp- like uh, impulse within us, but it also can feed both sides all the time. And that's why we find like, I mean, it's sort of like at the heart of celebrity because like celebrity culture has always been, whether it was just like, you know, gossip pages, so-and-so is on the cover because they were seen walking into the Bluefoot room with Carl Jr. Um, like, why, why, Us why? Weekly in 1920. Yes, <laughs> yes. Like, you know, page six. Like, I, like I'm, I'm sort of doing a nod to all these old, like, gossip rags, but, like, the entertainment circle, how we've always engaged in entertainment is one part marveling and one part dragging. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah, Jess, is, Jess is like, <laughs> I just did not see this getting so dark. But now well, I'm just processing. Is okay. No, I'm 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 glad you you said that because like there are upsides, and I'm if you didn't say that, then I would never even think about an upside to it. And I think that on the flip side, this the the that sort of myth of meritocracy, like I. To qualify, I don't think that myths are fundamentally a negative or bad thing. The idea that you actually, if given the access to the means of production, have more mobility than previous generations did, have the ability, like Lil Nas X, 15 years ago, would not have happened. Period, full stop, end of story. And it's only because of SoundCloud and then Twitter and then people recognizing like there's a bigger audience on those platforms that we need to get to our mainstream platforms that we're able to have all these nuanced conversations about him humping the devil, which I am into having all those conversations. They're delightful. So so basically, does this mean, well, if you make it, uh, you're going to get dragged and eaten by lions. Anyone now has a chance. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> to make Actually, it and be dragged and eaten by lions. <laughs> I will give you two very good examples of why this is so sad but true. You're right. It is. One, I suggest that everybody listen to uh, the You're Wrong About podcast, Triptych on Cancel Culture. It is one of the best things that I've heard about cancel culture at all. And they spend a ton of time talking about the Dixie Chicks getting canceled um, post 9-11. Uh, and the sort of like fervor that goes around that. But uh, the other thing that I always reference is um, So You've Been Publicly Shamed by John Ronson. Great book that really, like the feature story in that is about the agency executive who got on a flight to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, she got on a flight to... Yes, and then she like said, I'm going to Africa and all these people are going to die of AIDS or something like that. Tweeted it, got on the plane didn't have her phone on by the time she got off the plane like there were there was a twitter storm going on about the fact that like she didn't 15 hour flight yeah yes she had no clue this was going on she gets off the plane checks her phone news everywhere she's been fired like she had been publicly shamed by saying something really really dumb and reprehensible wasn't she also like she had taken ambien already and hadn't fallen asleep and then tweeted it or something like that yeah I believe so. And and the and the podcast that I'm referencing actually brings that whole uh, scenario up and they get into more detail about it. But I do think that giving everybody a microphone and everybody technically having the same volume knob like or setting, it's got downsides. Everybody can grab it. Everybody can say something like us yokels right now. Um, but hopefully there are things that are like valuable for the, for other people that don't really have anything to contribute. We all have to deal with it. It's like getting caught in Sauron's eye 
from the Lord <laughs> of the Rings, right? Like it's looking what? somewhere and it's like, are you in Sauron's eye? Like the beam is focused at you. What was the last thing you said when the beam comes looking at you, you know? Um, no, I don't know. What is that? What's Sauron's eye? I, I mean, that is a lot to explain. Sauron is the <laughs> yeah. big even have Oh, God. Time. No, no, no. Don't you? No, we're not doing that. We're not. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. But I think the other part of this, too, that you bring up is like some of this is a product of income inequality on like a fundamental level, right? Like, yes. It, where you, you, you don't have the same access to upward mobility. Like I saw a graph and we can share it uh, about sort of wealth distribution across generations. And like millennials have significantly less wealth at equivalent ages as like a total cohort compared to Gen X or which is a smaller group or baby boomers at the same age. And so, you know, obviously there are younger generations than us, but like their earning potential isn't being measured by economics, you know, people yet, um, economists, economics people. Um, <laughs> but that, that idea of like, if you don't have access to a means of upward mobility because wealth is so lopsided right now, then you're looking for any means to try and get it, even if it is an extreme gamble, right? Like for every Lil Nas X, there are a hundred thousand like well nas next that was all right that was all right joey <laughs> well stuck all um, right and and to add to that too <laughs> but but it could have gone bad but it was really solid i think the other thing too just i i think you're totally right and also i'm thinking of it globally too like america compared to other countries has significantly less um indicators of uh of intergenerational uh, economic mobility as well um, or like over one's lifetime and also between generations. So it's like compounding factors. We've got a generation of people who has less economic mobility and so many of the influencers that are being, that are like being promoted or coming out of this country that also has comparatively l lower um, economic mobility across generations and within their own lifespans. Sick. Womp, womp, <laughs> womp, well, basically. To Jess's Q score corner. <laughs> Q-score just is a rating of clout used to measure the success of movie stars' ability to sell movies, among other things. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, well, where to begin? Uh, from uh, let's just like recap some of the the brilliant phrases that have come out in the course of this conversation. For instance, the phrase. You know the poses she was doing. The mirage of individualism. The death of expertise. Theater versus Colosseum. Equal parts theater versus Colosseum, I think. Equal parts. And last but certainly not least, for every Lil Nas X, there's a Lil Nas <laughs> Next. 100, I can't. <laughs> yes. I just can't, I can't get I, that out. Oh, I love this, but who are we? <laughs> it's critical nonsense. But um, boom, that's a good wrap up. I like that. Yeah, I think we did it. Critical nonsense is a Sylvain production. Brought to you by Xanax. Hopefully, you don't need it after this episode. <laughs> As always, we'd like to thank executive producer and wrap up cube professional jess vander we'd also like to thank uh sound engineer and um boundary aficionado alex contel we always say aficionados but it's true every time every time <laughs> we'd like to thank les jacobs for doing everything right Less is more, mm -hmm. as we would say. And we would also like to thank Sarah Gilbert and Nora Mestrich. You are the duo creator economy. Thank you. And as always, thank you, Sarah, Elin. Thank you, so sorry. Special thanks. Mm. Lola Ooh. next. Hundred percent. It's gonna. He's gonna make it one day. All of them. Um, ooh, a shout out to uh, Bella Porch. Um, I'm behind on this, I understand. 
TikToker made the best or one of the most uh, the music video that was viewed the most number of times on YouTube ever in a 24 hour period. Um, that record just keeps getting broken, huh? Sorry. It's kind of like every week. Yeah. Her this name Olivia so Rodrigo was like yeah, very Olivia recently. Rodrigo. Yeah, no, Bella Porch has knocked her off her perch. So good job, Warner Brothers, on it. She snatched her driver's license. Um, I would like to give (laughs) a shout out and thank you to Ray Vaughn, whose performance on LA Leakers was dope. Uh, It was like new songs he's putting out. First encounter with him. We'll put the video in the show notes. It's, you know, it's bars. Mm, mm. You know, I want to give a special shout out and thank you to Mark Rober. Now you just got me into We do this a lot in this special thanks, which is like <laughs> YouTube stuff we watch. But this weekend, I watched Mark Rober do one of his amazing like science videos for kids. And like, I almost started bawling. I just wish that I had, I mean, we did, we had Bill Nye growing up, but I wish that we had a Mark Rober growing up to make me excited enough to be like an engineer at JPL or something like that. So Mark Rober, my goodness, keep doing what you do. You're amazing. I'll I'll close this special thanks with, um, I'm going to say thank you to cicadas, which may be (gasps) weird because, Mm -mm. Mm -mm. you know, them loud little bitches. Uh, Yes, yes. But they have been helping me like ensure that my daughter doesn't become phobic of bugs so we go cicada hunting every morning uh and like started with like the carapaces that they leave on the trees where they're like 100 percent not gonna move and then like then we found some that like still had them inside and they'd wiggle if you poke them and then we started finding like dead ones left out and then we started finding the live ones and poking them and seeing that nothing bad happened. So, you know, cicadas, you're annoying, but uh, thanks for helping me be a dad, I guess. Oh, thank you for being a dad. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's all I got. I love your entomological yeah. joy. And en- en- entomology? Yeah, Etymology yeah. words? Entomology yeah. bugs? Nice. Yeah. Well, happy nonsense to you. I'll see you next love time. Love you. Mean it. Bye. Bye. What is the solo creator con- mm, mm. Oh, wow, wow, wow.